Uh, all right, thanks a lot. We're uh, both really excited to be giving this talk about um, both Python and Star Wars and how to give a talk. Um, so if you guys don't know me, I'm Chan, uh, which under normal circumstances is really hard to get the pronunciation right. Uh, but since we've got a Star Wars theme going on today, we've got a really handy mnemonic. It's just the CH from Chewbacca plus the on from Han Solo, Chan. And you'll never get it wrong. Okay, and besides from that, um, I am an economist and grad student at the University of Chicago. Um, I use Python in my day-to-day -to, -day to collect and analyze data uh, for online marketplaces. All right, and I'm Catherine. Uh, super thrilled to be here tonight. I'm a software engineer at Narrative Science. I work on the data team there. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with pandas. I want to give a big shout out to Narrative Science. They're sponsoring our talk tonight, which means that uh, you can all go home and rewatch this video as many times as you like. <laughs> so uh, big thanks there. I'm also a co-organizer of the Chicago chapter of PyLadies. So if anybody has any questions about either Narrative Science or PyLadies, please feel free to talk to me afterwards. Um, I'm also a former math instructor. I have more than 10 years of experience teaching math, and that's actually one of the first things that got me interested in basically communicating technical topics effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a topic that we both care an awful lot about, um, and we also really like both Python and Star Wars, so there's going to be a lot of each of those tonight. Um, and we actually considered playing the roles of Han and Chewie, uh, but we decided that while well, you guys might really enjoy Catherine shooting from the hip and telling it straight, uh, you'd probably be a little less thrilled about me just kind of rambling incoherently while everyone pretends to understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Although you guys have probably been in a few of those talks, I'm sure. Um, he's not really the best role model for speaking. Okay, so that's who we are. Um, it's worth saying that we are definitely not experts at this. We're still learning quickly. Um, and we're also not naturally talented. And, like, really, we started with zero natural talent. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're going to say is that you really don't need to be naturally talented to do this well. Um, the thing that you do need is you need to really decide to care about communication and prioritize it above everything else. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that. Uh, so if we don't know anything ourselves, uh, where do we go for wisdom? And the clear answer in our kind of Python Star Wars universe is uh, Yoda Van Rossum. So, uh, because he's wise, and he can see the future, and he talks funny. Um, you know, both with a Dutch accent, and he says his sentence is a little backwards. Okay, and where does Yoda live? Anyone? Dagobah. Dagobah, right. So one thing you guys might not know is that Dagobah isn't just a made-up word. It's actually uh, lifted from Buddhism. It's a term for a Buddhist holy site. So actually, quite intentionally, we're meant to think of Dagobah as the Zen planet, and Yoda as the Zen master. So this is the first puzzle piece in our uh, Python Star Wars theory of everything. And here's another thing uh, which you may not have realized. Dagobah is the home of friendly pythons. So if you go back and watch the movie, you'll notice that there are pythons in practically every shot on Dagobah, just slithering around, keeping it real. Um, so you know, when we realized this, uh, we knew that we were onto something. So the Zen of Python is coming. Uh, we're we're going to get there. OK, so. Yep. All right, so before we get to the Zen of Python, um, I want to give a little bit of an overview of what to expect from this talk. Basically, the talk is structured around some high-level ideas, and we try to ground those high-level abstract ideas in more concrete guidelines. Um, those guidelines are not meant to be rules. They can certainly be broken, but we didn't want it all to be sort of so high level and esoteric that there was no actionable uh, stuff that you could take away from the presentation. Uh, also, the focus is really not going to be on delivering or performing a presentation. It's going to be about how to develop the content of your presentation so that it's engaging and effectively communicates to the audience. Um, this emphasis on communication is something I really want to highlight. Um, a lot of the high-level ideas apply to communication a lot more generally, not just communicating in a talk or a presentation. So I encourage you to think about, as we're going through the presentation and these high-level ideas, the guidelines are going to apply just to talks, but the high-level ideas can certainly be applied a lot more generally. So um, one of the assumptions that we make during this presentation is that the point of a talk, or at least a major point of a talk, 
is to communicate some idea or knowledge that you have with the audience. Uh, it, it's also valid to give a talk to practice communicating, right? Uh, and that's something that we're gonna circle back to towards the end. Last thing before we jump into the Zen of Python, um, we don't expect you to remember everything that we say here tonight. After all, it's gonna be online. You can always go back and rewatch it. We're gonna talk at a high level about five or six different ideas. If you can take away two of them, if two in particular really resonate with you so, so much that you can maybe have a conversation about them with somebody tomorrow, we're gonna be super thrilled and consider this a success. So just focus on, on two things. All right, great. So the Zen of Python, this is something that many of you are probably familiar with. For those of you who aren't, these are sort of core principles of Python that as Python programmers we aspire to. So beautiful is better than ugly, explicit is better than implicit. And as we were designing this presentation, we realized that, you know, yeah, these apply really nicely to Python and to programming, but they also apply to communicating and giving a presentation really nicely. So we're, gonna, we're not gonna go through all of the Zen, but we're gonna pick a few that, that especially apply. And we're gonna start with one of my favorites, actually, explicit is better than implicit. Um, so what exactly does that mean? To get a sense of what explicit is better than implicit means, let's look at, it, uh, at two examples. So up here I have some code from, some Django code, right? And you'll notice that this code sort of tells a story, right? You can see, you can trace through this code, you can see where things came from, and you can get a sense of where things are going, right? This, there's a, a thread of logic that's woven through this code. Let's compare this to the Ruby on Rails code on the bottom. So Ruby on Rails subscribes to the principle convention over configuration. And what does that mean? Well, what that means is that the thread of logic that we see in the Django code isn't really in the Rails code. It's hidden, right? Which actually is pretty convenient if you're an expert Rails programmer, right? It allows you to focus just on the aspects of your code that are unconventional. But for somebody who isn't an expert, who may not be familiar with Ruby on Rails, there's a lot of magic happening down here, right? What's happening with all posts? Where is it coming from? Where is it going? When you're giving a presentation, you don't want there to be magic. You want there to be that thread of logic, that narrative, if you will, that pervades everything that you talk about. Um, I really wanna emphasize explicit is better than implicit is not about going into all the gory details. It's about finding that narrative in your talk, defining it for your audience explicitly. Your audience needs to know what you're talking about and you need to tell them why you're talking about it. So how can you do this? Well, first and foremost, it need, the narrative needs to exist, right? You need to have that conversation with yourself. What are you talking about and why are you talking about it? And then, as I said, you need to make that explicit to the audience and link it to absolutely everything in the presentation. This is something that we're gonna come back to a lot. Um, does X relate to my narrative? Why am I including it, right? Uh, and perhaps most importantly, the narrative needs to have broad appeal to your audience. Your audience needs to care about it. If the audience doesn't care, they're gonna check out. So how do you design a presentation that has broad appeal to the audience? Well, the first thing to do is to identify who your audience is, right? So when we were designing this talk, we sort of asked, okay, who are the people who are gonna be coming? Well, it's a whole bunch of Python programmers, right? Um, maybe we don't know what your specific interests are or what your skill level is, but we know you like Python. Once you identify your audience, ask yourself the question, what do, you, what do they wanna know? It's not so much about what we as presenters want to communicate, but rather what you wanna hear from us. Which isn't to say that you don't have any influence over that, right? You can totally motivate your audience to be interested. Um, however, that's your responsibility. You have to make the audience want to hear what you're saying. And this is, this is true in any talk, but it's especially true in a technical talk because technical talks are hard, guys, right? I mean, there comes a point in any technical talk where people are gonna have to start thinking. And if you haven't shown them, if you haven't convinced them that that thinking is worthwhile, they simply won't do it. Um, you should be operating under the assumption that your audience doesn't care about your topic and you have one to two slides to change their mind.
Yeah, so I mean, guys, the idea here is not that your audience is completely indifferent to what you're talking about. I mean, they came to your talk, they're here to learn. But, you know, thinking is really hard work. And, you know, if you don't give them enough of a reason, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the time they do that work and don't get much out of it. So you really have to convince them that they're going to get a good return on their investment. And half of that is building up this narrative so that they understand what the payoff is going to be if they do the work and follow along. Uh, and the other half is doing the work as the presenter to make it as simple as possible so that they don't have to do too much to keep up. Uh, and that brings us to our next Zen of Python, simple is better than complex. So we have this really nice quote here related by Brian Bai. There are two kinds of teachers. One goes up to the blackboard and says, look how smart I am. The other says, look how easy this is. Uh, so this is one of my favorite quotes. And if you think about it for a minute, you realize that it applies far more generally than just to teaching. It applies to speakers in a talk. It applies to coders writing code that's either going to be opaque or clear. Uh, it applies to pretty much any medium in which there's some kind of communication component to it. And you know, basically, what we want to say is, when you're designing your talk, you should be pushing yourself in the direction of, look how easy this is and stay away as much as you can from look how smart I am. I mean, it is definitely quicker and easier to just dump your code on the screen and think to yourself, well, I understand it, so you know, if you don't understand it, then that's a problem with you and not me. But that's really not the right way to approach a technical talk. Uh, so, uh, you know, and this, fortunately for us, this is very much in line with you know, the principles that we try to uphold when we are programming in Python. I mean, the whole idea of simple is better than complex is to minimize the amount of thinking that someone reading the code has to do to figure out what everything is saying. Um, and you know, the, sa the very same thing applies to a talk. In fact, even more so, because when you're sitting in the audience, thinking is really hard. Like, you don't get to set your own pace. You don't get to look back at the previous slide if you forgot something. Uh, and at the same time, understanding is the entire purpose. So at least if your code is opaque, it can still accomplish something when you hit run. But if your talk fails to communicate to people, then you almost might as well not have been speaking. So, so it's really important to take this to heart. Um, so uh, to address this, we're going to introduce this concept of playing grandma's advocate. Uh, so the problem is that by default, we humans just tend to vastly overestimate how easy it is to understand what we're saying. And you know, it's, I think a lot of what happens, especially for people who are new at giving talks, they're thinking, gosh, the people in the audience are so much smarter than me. They have so much more experience. They're going to follow this really quickly. And you know, the truth of the matter is just that all of their intelligence and experience is a really poor substitute for the sheer amount of time that you have spent thinking about whatever it is that you're talking about. So that's really important. Uh, and you know, if you have not yet purged this bias from your system, uh, which we all kind of start with, you know, here's a really rough rule of thumb for what it takes to kind of get into the ballpark. You almost have to divide your naive estimate of how many people are going to understand by 10. And that will at least probably get you within 10%. Um, OK, so, so just as devil's advocate is always arguing that you're wrong, grandma's advocate is always arguing that your talk is not clear enough yet. So, uh, so you know, we, what we want to encourage you to do is when you're designing a technical talk, you, know, you have to play grandma's advocate with yourself. You just have to push on this. Is it clear enough yet? How about now? How about now? And you just have to keep hammering away at it until it's so crystal that finally communication can take place. I mean, that is really what it takes. And it's, it's insane, but it's true. Um, OK. Um, so here's some pushback. Uh, so I'm not really saying that you should simplify, simplify, simplify your talk to the point where there's no longer any technical in your technical talk. Technical subjects are complex. And you're not trying to eliminate that complexity. You're trying to manage it for your audience. You're trying to focus on the stuff that matters and hide the stuff that doesn't. Uh, so you know, your focus should always be on advancing this narrative. And technical details exist to support that narrative. And you should be as much as possible hiding the extraneous details that distract from it. Well, the good news, that is really hard. But we are programmers. So basically, nobody is in a better position to abstract away from irrelevant technical details. So we understand really well this idea of doing a bunch of work, putting it inside a black box, and then other people can use that black box without themselves having to go inside and reduplicate all the thinking that you've already done for them. 
Uh, and a talk is the same way. I mean, often you're going to be presenting on something that you've put a lot of work on, some project that you've been working for months on, and you, know, you don't want to just dump it all on the screen and have them wade through stuff. Your job is to focus it onto the stuff that matters and avoid the stuff that doesn't. Okay, so to make this a bit more concrete, uh, we're going to actually enlist the help of Darth Vader. Uh, so if you guys recall, when Luke is training on Dagobah for the first time, um, his training is going pretty well, and then uh, Darth Vader shows up to dinner on Cloud City and captures all of his friends. And then at that point, he can no longer focus on his training anymore, and he has to leave and just gives up. So here's a plot of how much attention your audience is paying to your talk versus uh, their upcoming dinner plans as a function of how much code you're trying to stick on the slide. Uh, and you can see that over there to the left, there's not enough. So you're not, you're not giving them enough technical material to keep them busy. They don't have to think very hard to understand what you're saying. Uh, so they're mostly just thinking about dinner. And conversely, over here to the right, <laughs> um, there's too much. They are overwhelmed with code. And when you put this much code on every slide, the result is not that they end up understanding about half of it, just not all of it. The result is typically that they just check out. They stop absorbing things, and they're bored and paying attention to something else. But there is this nice sweet spot in the middle where Darth is very impressed with the balance that you've managed to create. Uh, so that's what we're going for. Does anyone know how I created this plot, by the way? That looks like Darth Vader's helmet. Yeah, it, it, it does look like Did Darth Vader's helmet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, so if you guys don't know, this functionality to style your graphs uh, as XKCD-esque uh, graphs is built right into Matplotlib now. Uh, and I highly recommend it as a tool for presentations. It's not really appropriate for a paper, but for a presentation, it really adds you know, some dimension. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so I, I, before we move on from this slide, I really want to emphasize that this isn't su supposed, the, the point of this isn't so much about the number of, of lines of code on your slide as it is what lines you've chosen to include, right? So you really have to think when you're going through and when you're throwing, when you're throwing code up in front of people, why are you including this line of code? Does it advance your narrative or is it a distracting detail? So to, to dive a little bit deeper into this, uh, let's suppose that I wanted to show you guys how we made this graph. Um, we made this graph, it's about 40 lines of code. It's not particularly complicated or hard, but 40 lines of code is way too much to throw up on one slide, right? So the question is, how do we present that? The first thing we have to ask ourselves is, what, well, what is the communication goal? Why am I showing you that code to begin with? And I'm gonna assume that the point is to A, show you that this feature exists, and B, show you that it is, in fact, easy. Um, so I've, we've done that up here, and there are a couple things to point out. First of all, this plot, the plot on this slide is simpler than the plot on the previous slide. We can take away the extra curves. There's only one curve plotted. That's perfectly fine. Some of the text has been removed. That's fine because those lines of code do not contribute to my communication goal, to my narrative. Um, we've also done two other things of note. Uh, the first is just simply removed lines that aren't relevant. And the second is encapsulated ideas that don't really have much to do with XKCD. So um, the only line of code that actually generates this, like makes it XKCD style, as opposed to just a standard matplotlib graph, is this one line of code up here, the third line, the plt.xkcd. Um, so why not just include that line? Well. The context that the other lines of code provide really emphasizes the point that this is, in fact, easy, right? You don't want to strip out all the details. You just want to find a balance between the details and, um, and the stuff that's actually relevant to the point that you're making. Yeah. Oh, oh here's another Python on the Zen planet. Um, so, guys, I actually... Um, I looked at the list of top 50 programming languages, and none of the other ones are remotely represented. Uh, so we're really special in this. Uh, OK, so we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about a couple principles of slide design. Uh, because you know, there are 
that's really often an important point, part of your technical talk. Uh, and there's a couple mistakes that people make very frequently, which really just erect a wall between them and the audience. Uh, and, and they're not that difficult to avoid. You just kind of have to realize they exist. <laughs> Um, okay, so the first one is sparse is better than dense. Uh, so there is such a thing as uh, too much white space, but this is not usually the mistake people make. You usually see something more like this. Um, and this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, so uh, there's this tremendous urge sometimes to just kind of stick as much information as you possibly can onto a slide. And it's almost always a bad idea. Uh, and for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that the audience simply cannot absorb this much information. I mean, this is just garbage. But if this were really technical details that you needed to know, uh, good luck actually absorbing or retaining even a tenth of it. Uh, so you know, if you try to do that, it's just going to fail. Uh, another thing is you, know, you should be thinking of this talk as a very guided tour. You're trying to kind of carve this optimal path through a complex piece of machinery uh, in such a way that people are coming along with you and can understand something about how the machinery works as a result. Uh, you don't ever want them to kind of be confused about what it is they should be thinking about right now. So if I'm talking and there's a bunch of stuff on the screen that doesn't really relate to what I'm saying, uh, you know, what do you guys focus on? You don't, you don't even know, well, you guys are probably just reading the slide and not even <laughs> listening to what I'm saying. So, you know, why am I even talking right now? Uh, well, maybe I'm just killing time. <laughs> Maybe I'm just killing time uh, so that you guys can finish reading the slide, because if I go too soon, you're going to be upset that there was stuff you didn't get to yet, which is just another reason not to put this much stuff on a slide. So don't do it. Are you guys ready? Can we move on? <laughs> yes? All right. So related to sparse is better than dense, readability counts. Um, there's this temptation, I mean, on usually when we kind of get into that stage where we're trying to cram a bunch of stuff onto a slide, there can be this temptation to just make the font smaller. Um, <laughs> this is not a good solution. Um, can anybody actually, oh, in the, yeah. at least in the back of the room, can anybody read this? <coughs> oh, okay, wow, that's awesome. I wow. can barely read this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this leads to the dark side, guys. Resist the urge. Come back to your narrative. Why are you trying to throw all that stuff onto one slide? Are all of those details really necessary to advance your narrative? Um, about half the time when I'm designing a presentation and I ask myself that question, at least half the time, the answer is no, I can get rid of stuff. But if the answer really is yes and all that text needs to be there, Split up the slide into multiple slides. Um, don't just cram stuff onto the slide. Think about what the point is. A good general rule of thumb is that the font on your slide should be large enough that no more than 20 lines of text can fit on the slide. Um, don't try to fill all 20 lines, right? I mean, the point here is not to get as much as you can on the slide. It's to think about what needs to go on that slide to communicate your point. Hey, another Python. <laughs> uh, yeah, this guy's just kind of keeping it real while Luke has his imaginary fight with Darth Vader. Um, yeah, so can you yeah. click? Uh, so I think at this point we've really proven that uh, the Zen planet is literally covered with Pythons. Um, go ahead. And uh, it's just got to be the case that George Lucas is really into the Zen of Python. OK? All right, next up, errors should never pass silently. One of the things we said at the beginning is that, A, we're not that good at this, right? At least not naturally good at this. Um, and I really want to emphasize that the way you get better at this is by practicing. That means that you have to be aware of whatever, quote, errors you're making. Um, so solicit feedback, guys. Um, bring a friend with you to an event like this and, and get critical uh, and constructive feedback afterwards. Last night, we presented this presentation to a friend that we had visiting and had her give us feedback. Um, the only way you can improve is if people, if you reflect on what happened um, and, and you similarly ask other people for that same feedback. Yeah, so actually, one of the things we're going to be experimenting with tonight is kind of implementing a feedback system into Chippy. Uh, and we're hoping, uh, so for now it's just a paper form, and I know we're going to probably uh, get a more technologically advanced solution at some point. Um, but after the talk, we're going to pass these around, and we're really hoping that a lot of you will give us you know, good constructive feedback on this talk. I mean, the way we see it is that feedback is so valuable and generally so underutilized. And, you know, 
we put a lot of work into our talk, and you guys put a lot of work into watching it, and you know things that we have done wrong that we aren't aware of. And if we just you know, throw that information away, it's such a waste. So you know, it would really be great if we could create this environment where people can, can give talks and get a lot of good feedback as a result. And hopefully it would eventually become you know, a, a major benefit of giving a talk at Chippy. Uh, the, because a lot of the time, you have to kind of do the work yourself if you want feedback. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I really want to emphasize again that we are not delivering a perfect talk to tonight, and I am not ashamed of that. Um, there is no shame in making mistakes, especially if you can learn from them, right? As software developers, we often iterate. That's just how it works. That's how you improve. So don't be afraid of making mistakes. Um, one more thing about feedback. What is good feedback? As long as we're talking about feedback. So everybody's gotten error messages like this before. This is actually one of my like, le I hate it when this happens, when your code's basically like, you messed up. Well, thanks, thanks code. Um, it's really unhelpful to get feedback uh, on say a talk that's like, I didn't like your talk. Um, I wasn't interested. I don't know what to do with that feedback, right? I can't get better. Uh, but if your feedback is both specific and actionable, I didn't understand what you meant by grandma's advocate. Um, I can't hear you from the back of the room. Those are things that we can improve upon, right? So when you're giving feedback for a talk, for anything, make sure that you're considering, is my feedback actionable? Mm -hmm. I would like to say that this is actually feedback that I got on the grandma's advocate slide. So I had to actually play grandma's advocate on the grandma's advocate slide to make it clear <laughs> enough so that people could understand it. Uh, so yeah, it's really important. If that hadn't, if Catherine had not told that to me, I would not have realized it, and you guys would all just be kind of confused about who Grandma is and why she needs an advocate. Um, okay, and the last one we're going to talk about is now is better than never, uh, and we're going to twist the meaning of this one a bit and just say that you know, the only way to get good at this is to practice, starting as soon as possible. You just have to practice a lot with your ears open collecting feedback, and constantly improving yourself. Uh, it would be really nice if we could just import speaking talent from the future, but unfortunately, our brains get programmed by doing things repeatedly. That's just how they work. Uh, so, you know, on the other hand, it's good that natural talent is really not necessary. It's really nothing more than a starting point. The important thing is that you decide to prioritize communication and do the things that are necessary to, to get that done. Uh, and uh, just to conclude that, you know, you work hard to make your code clear, so work hard to make your talks clear too. All right, so in sum, what did we talk about tonight? First, explicit is better than implicit. Make sure that your talk has a narrative and that that narrative is explicit. Simple is better than complex, and complex is better than complicated. Uh, it's your job to manage the complexity and the technical aspects of your talk for your audience. Sparse is better than dense and readability counts. Make sure that your slides are designed in a way that actually furthers the communication goals that you have for your talk. And finally, errors should never pass silently and now is better than never. Uh, this is not natural, something that you have to be naturally good at to get good at. Iterate, practice, start now. Um, yeah. yeah, so we're gonna leave you with um, what I think of as kind of the capstone in our uh, brand new Python theory of everything for Star Wars. This is Luke's Zen moment. So he's in the Death Star Trench, and he's just switched off his targeting computer. He's taken a couple of deep breaths, and just before he fires his shot, he mutters a couple words under his breath. And I think that for the first time, we have a, the correct theory of what he actually said. <laughs> It's got to be, right? Yeah. I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. So I think from this, we can definitely conclude that the Zen of Python is a source of deep wisdom and power that applies far more broadly than just your Python code. So that's what we got for you guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Questions, right? Any questions about talks? Yeah, we're talks? happy to so take